this is a unit, a unit of a lizard, and this is called a blue tongue skink. Maybe the most underrated and underappreciated lizard on the planet, and they make great pets too. So today, I'm gonna tell you how to take care of them and why you'd want one in the first place. My name's Adam, this is Erwin. You're watching Wiccan's Wicked Reptiles. Stick around. Oh boy, oh boy, could I tell you how much I love blue tongue skinks. These are, in my opinion, one of the coolest lizards on the planet, and I'm lucky to own two. I've got Irwin, who's an Indonesian, which come from Indonesia, and of course, New Guinea as well, which technically, anyway, the point being, there's also Australian varieties, such as Northerns, like my boy Steve here. Yes, Steve and Irwin. You got it all figured out. And of course, uh, there's Centralians too, but they're really uncommon. So today, let's talk about Indonesians and let's talk about Northerns because there are a few differences, but I'm gonna tell you how to take care of them all. Starting off with our first category, size. How big do these freaking things get? Well, this is maybe one of the biggest Indonesians I've ever seen. In general, Indonesians have longer tails and have smaller bodies than Northerns. Now, of course, I have a Northern that is much smaller than Irwin is, so it just depends. I mean, there's outliers, right? And I would say that Irwin is maybe the biggest of all the Indos I've ever seen. Now he's got this really cool red throat, which is another difference because the, you're not gonna see that with the Northerns, which of course have a different coloration. So this is about 28 inches of lizard, which is much, much larger than you'd see because usually 18 inches is where Indos are gonna top out, where Northerns can get up to two feet, sometimes 30 inches. So for that reason, I just think Indos sometimes make better pets for some people because they might get away with a smaller enclosure. So let's talk about that next. Well, first, before we do that, let's talk about how freaking thick these guys are. This is like, I feel like I'm doing a little bit of a delt workout here, just holding them up. So Erwin, you need to diet. Not really. He's actually, this is perfect. This is how they're supposed to look. Okay, let's talk about enclosures. Enclosures for these guys are dependent. I think that either way you can use a PVC enclosure. That's what I like because you can stack them up. They look nice. They're one on top of each other. Of course, the parameters are different. So you could keep a screen lid. So say an aquarium, a 75 gallon is in my opinion, the bare minimum, but I would recommend something like a four by two by two. That's what I recommend for you. So it's about 120 gallons of space. And for that reason, I think that you could keep in an aquarium if you want it, but because of the humidity requirements, you want an Indonesian likely to be in something that has a more sealed option like PVC that's gonna hold humidity far better. Speaking of skinks, they're just monkey tail skinks making a racket over there. Monkey tail skinks are actually bigger than blue tongue skinks. So let's say that you have a four by two by two. The substrate is gonna be something that holds a little bit of humidity or a lot of humidity. And for that reason, I like cocoa core and cocoa chunk or chip or husk, whatever you wanna call it, mixed together because it's gonna hold humidity, but it also can dry out pretty well and it's not gonna cause issues. You could use paper towel, you could use slates. I don't like these options. They don't look as nice in my opinion. So I think that for, especially for Indos, which like it a little bit more humid, I like to use a naturalistic substrate. Now you could use plants if you want to keep the humidity up, but these are big lizards. They're gonna trample them. I don't really recommend it. And don't go with pothos because pothos is toxic and these guys will try to eat it. Where with monkey tail skinks, I don't know why I'm comparing. They can actually eat pothos, but most things can't. Give them a water bowl so that they can drink water, right? This is really important. Make sure you miss the enclosure and of course give them a food bowl too. We're gonna talk about food in a sec, but a dedicated food bowl is a good option because they eat messy things. Give them a couple hides as well. This can be, you know, naturalistic cork bark or cork rounds or whatever, or you can use a turned over Tupperware with a hole in it. It's really up to you, but either way, make sure that they feel super secure if they want, and then give them some kind of clutter in between their hides if they choose that too. And then give them some gauges. So a hydrometer, thermometer, hygrometer, I think it's, anyway, there's a link in the description for the ones that I use. You can go there. I make a small commission if you use it. I'm not getting rich, but those are the ones that I use. And of course, that way you can keep an eye on temperature, humidity, and lighting. And that's our next category. So this is where things kind of go a little bit different, even more than size. Because if we're talking about Indonesians first, temperature wise, they like it a little bit cooler because they come from places that are foresty, kind of shrubby, 
places like that. So for example, this is an Indonesian jungle that I'm walking through right now. So they're like a little bit more humid because they're not gonna get as much exposure to sun and UVB, which we'll talk about in a sec. So man, those monkey tails are so loud. So you want a gradient. This means that you have a cool end and a warm end, and then in the middle, it's a gradient up to it, right? So on the cool end for an Indo, you want mid 70s, high 70s. Now, if your enclosure is 75 or 78 on the cool side, don't worry about it. It's a care guide. These things don't have exact parameters in the wild, you're fine. And then you want a warm side that's gonna be in the mid 80s, somewhere around there. And then give them a basking site, so somewhere that's warmer, they can collect to temperature, collect heat from, and that's gonna be about 95 for Indos. Now, these are the exact same things I'd recommend for Northerns. Northerns can tolerate a higher temperature on the warm side, and their basking site, I suggest around 100, 105. Or give them multiple basking sites, but they like it a little bit warmer and they're going to like it a little bit drier too so the night drop before we get to humidity i mean 65 is as low as it would go you don't really need to give a night drop i've been to indonesia at night it doesn't really drop that much maybe a couple degrees for most of the year so either way humidity is really important because if you don't have the right humidity they can get respiratory infections scale issues with shedding and things like that I keep this guy around 70 and then around 50% for my Northern Steve. And in terms of lighting, if you want to use a basking light, you can definitely do that. They're diurnal animals, which means they're awake during the day. So it's going to replicate the sun. And of course they like UVB. Both are okay with a 6.0 UVB. If you don't know what that means, do a little bit of research on UVB. Usually they're coming a 2.0, 6.0, 10.0, 12.0, You want around a six. You could go maybe a little bit higher for Northerns if you put it up higher off the, the ground, but I recommend a 6.0, a linear UVB. Now let's talk about diet, because it turns out if you feed your skink, they live a heck of a lot longer than if you don't. And the nice thing is, it's easy and fun. One of my favorite things about blue tongue skinks is that they're omnivores. So they can eat things like snails and crickets and worms, but they're also gonna eat things like, I don't know, dog food, cat food. Uh, do your research on how much to feed, of course. They can eat things like Bluey Buffet, which is a, a rapashi product. So kind of like what you'd feed to a Cresta Gecko, except for it's got different ingredients, of course. And then fresh vegetables too. So I give him spring mix and beans and peppers and arugula, all sorts of different stuff. And then you supplement them correctly. I don't really cover supplementation in the care guides because they're so debated. The way that I do it is the Bluey Buffet has supplements in it. So I feed that to him twice a week. And then I dust with calcium and a multivitamin every other feeding when I feed crickets and worms and stuff like that. And honestly, I don't feed crickets that much. It's mostly worms because they're not the greatest hunters in the world. I also like to feed quail eggs. I mean, realistically, you want 50% of their diet about that to be animal products. So this would include dog food, cat food. And then of course you want 40% to be vegetables and then 10% to be fruit, something like that. And I only give them fruit maybe once a month or a couple times a month. So it's actually really easy to feed these guys. And that's one of my favorite parts because watching this guy with blue buffet all over his face, like you can see right now is freaking hilarious and so cute in my opinion. Now let's talk about behavior. Uh, these guys, I mean, they can drop their tails. It's pretty unlikely. You'd have to really yank on it, but don't do that. In general, they can become pretty placid. I mean, this boy here is really easy to take care of. He's really easy to handle. He hasn't really moved much. He's a little bit wiggly when you first get him out, but he's never really tried to bite me. And of course you're gonna know, they're gonna huff and puff and oftentimes show that blue tongue, which is why they're called blue tongue skinks. That is to say, hey, I'm big, I'm scary, I might be poisonous, don't eat me or else you're gonna get hurt. I'm gonna hurt you back. So obviously they're not venomous or poisonous, so you're not gonna have to worry about that. But if they give you a chomp, it doesn't feel great. I've never taken, well, Steve gave me a chomp once when he was a baby, but in the most part, I don't have issues like that because they're pretty docile, pretty easy to handle. And because they're terrestrial, they're not gonna be climbing mountains. You can give them low logs to climb on, but they're definitely not gonna be using a whole bunch of space in the air. They're mostly gonna be on the ground kind of wiggling around because they're basically potatoes with legs. Yes, I did call you a potato. What are you gonna do about it? But in general, I mean, they move pretty slow. They can move a little bit quick, but they're not gonna be as fast as a colubrid or a small gecko or anything like that. They can't climb walls. They have eyelids that work. They have ears that are external and 
work very well and very pronounced. Just make sure you're taking care of them and they're gonna be pretty easy to handle, pick up, and things like that. I mean, they're obviously not gonna crawl around on you like a gecko would, but you can handle them and kind of pet them and give them chin scratches and the whole thing. Now lastly, price, availability, and morph. Because if you can't find one and you can't afford one, then what's the point of the video? Nice thing is, you can afford them and you can find them most of the time. You can find them in basically every reptile shop. I recommend you buy it from a reptile shop or a breeder. If you buy from a big box store, they don't really have the most ethical practices of where they get their animals. So don't do that. And of course, if you're getting an Indo, try to get a captive born and bred because Indonesia still ships animals out. So you can still get animals that were caught in the wild. I don't recommend getting wild caught animals for so many reasons, but for Northerns, they're always going to be captive bred because Australia doesn't ship their animals out anymore unless they were smuggled and there's no point in smuggling them because there's not a big enough market. So you're safe to know you're getting a captive bred species. Now, in terms of morphs, for Indonesia, there are some localities that you can get that look a little bit different, but no morphs that I really know of that are all the way available. Now, in fact, there are morphs available in Australians versions, so Centralians and then Northerns especially, but they are pretty pricey, they are pretty expensive, they can be pretty hard to find. But in terms of price, you can definitely afford these guys. I mean, you can get probably 250 bucks for an Indonesian especially if it's a baby. Northerns are gonna be more expensive, three, four, five. And then in the morphs, I mean, the sky is the limit depending on what it is. So they're not that expensive. They're not the cheapest thing in the world, but I mean, you can find them, you can afford them, and there are a bunch of morphs. So I want you to let me know in the comment section below what you think about blue tongue skinks. Would you ever get one? So shiny, look at that. Anyway, uh, thanks for hitting the like and subscribe button. You guys are amazing. It really helps the channel more than you could ever know. And as always, a special thanks to the Patreon supporters. You guys get videos early, discounts on merch, so much more for as little as $1 a month. And that's it. I do videos on Mondays and Thursdays. That means I'll see you in the next one.